I've invited today Dr. Deirdre Butler, Dr. Michael Hallisey, to come and present to you on the National Digital Strategy. Some of you may be aware of it, may be aware of it from the point of view of the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources. But today I want to hand over the podium to both Michael and Deirdre for them to present to you exactly what it is that is happening. Good morning, everybody. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be here this morning. Um, both Deirdre and I have a long association with uh, SESI Conference. Um, actually, the last time I gave a keynote at SESI was a long, long time ago. Um, it was um, around a project I was involved in called Ednet. Some of you in the room will remember that. That was in Tala. Um, just to correct a few things, um, or to put it maybe in context a bit more. What we're going to talk about this morning is we're going to share our perspectives. Deirdre uh, has been working with the Department of Education and Science on the digital strategy for schools. And she's, she'll tell you about it herself in a minute. She's been doing some research for them, but she's also written a paper as part of the digital strategy for schools. Uh, as Adrian said, the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources have got the ball rolling here with uh, their overall digital strategy. So within education, <coughs> um, we now have the digital, we're looking at a digital strategy for schools. And I suppose what we're going to tr try and do this morning in the context of SESI is put some thoughts out there for you to think about. We're going to ask you a question. You're going to have to talk to the person beside you in a few minutes. Um, because we think that it's really, really important to go back on some of the points that Dahi has made and the minister that we look at the whole area of professional development in a different way uh, in this new strategy. And it is an opportunity to kind of look to the past, but also going forward uh, to see um, what we could do differently. I'm not going to give you a history lesson, but those of us in the room that have been around this for a long time, and Ceci has been here all the time through this, but it's wor worth remembering that, and I suppose this is probably why I was asked here today, I was involved as a researcher on the strategy that started in 97, um, Schools IT 2000, and now Deirdre is working as a researcher with the department on the, the current strategy. So you're going to get more of Deirdre this morning and a lot less of me. But I just think it's worth recalling that we have had a number of policy documents over that period of time. And that is not to say that computers and technology only arrived in schools in 1996-97. Many of you in this room were pioneering in your classrooms with acorns and micros and uh, apples long before there was any policy. And I think that there, was a, there is some similarities between now and when we had Schools IT 2000 start. There is a chance to try and learn from the lessons of the past and hopefully that we will have a better success on ICT integration going forward. You can see on the screen there have been a number of documents and uh, the only point I want to make is that I think some of the things that were in the, the first strategy, Schools IT 2000, some of the things that people put in that strategy, and I was there at the time with others, when it came to implementation they took on a different life than that than what we had anticipated. I think what happened was that we created an agency called the National Centre for Technology and Education, the NCT, and we expected they would solve every single problem associated with ICT. And any of you who were involved at that time, if there was a new initiative around curriculum and technology was going to be handed over to the NCT and another agency got on with the curriculum or whatever. So I think that's a mistake because what that message sends is that ICT is something that is silent, it's something separate. And that take that down to the school level, all too often it's ICT is something that we either teach or it's something that somebody else is going to teach and it's not part of my teaching role. <coughs> so the latest chapter is we have a programme for government. Now, I'm sure many of you don't spend your time reading the programme for government, but I'm just going to read, I'm going to read just the top line because I think this is where we're at and this is why we're at the big chapter. I'm definitely getting there, you know. 
Glad I didn't even get I had two sets of glasses and somebody was laughing. Anyway, <coughs> and this is from the program for government. We'll end the treatment of ICT and education as a standalone issue, but we'll integrate it across education policy. This will begin with merging the National Centre for Technology and Education with the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. A new plan to develop ICT and Education Learning and Assessment will be developed, and I won't read the rest. The next line, the primary priority for investment is the broadband and uh, greater use of online, etc. Et I think the key line for me in that is that ICT is going to be integrated and that we're not going to keep it out as something separate. One of the key themes we're going to talk about this morning is teachers' professional practice. Somebody once said, good teachers always use good technology. And it's something that all of you in this room do every single day. But all too often your colleagues feel that that's not their job, it's somebody else's job. So hopefully, we can, with the new strategy, we'll see that it's much more uh, front and centre. I suppose just to set the scene for Deirdre, the government, the current government, have completed a number of actions already. The first is Minister Rabbit in the Department of Communications has rolled out the 100 megabit broadband to the second level schools. All of you in primary around the room are saying, well, when are we getting it? And I do know that there are some pilots going on looking at that issue. And really, that is a key piece of infrastructure that needs to be there. But a couple of years ago, I nearly wrote a paper called 100, bit, 100, bit, 100 megabit broadband, so what? Because 100 megabit broadband, without changes in how we teach and how we design learning for the learners, isn't going to change anything. That's for another day. The other initiative, and I see Sean's here this morning, is that the NCT is now merged into the PDST technology in education. And I welcome that strongly. I think that's a really good move because professional development is critical in all of this. We know a lot um, about where we should be and where we could be. In 1996, when we started off, there wasn't as much known about uh, technology in schools. But one of the things we do know is that professional development of teachers is critical. And now I'm going to hand over to Deirdre, and she's going to set the scene in relation to the new strategy. Um, I think what we have to think about, and it's great to be here this morning, is the fact that um, the digital strategy for schools is your strategy. You write it, and you design it for you. And that you have a moral imperative for the students to actually interact with in the schools, that you make sure that that strategy reflects your thinking. Because if it doesn't, something then else is designed that doesn't work for you. Okay? So, I'm using Dottie's papers. Okay, we'll just forward and we'll just back. Um, can everybody hear me? Does this, no. this work in the mic? The mic working for everybody? Not very good. I think what we have to do is look ahead. <coughs> you have to consider what's the future of education. Donnie put it up to you as well. What is the National Digital Strategy for Schools? And this child is has, asking how it support my learning. That's the question that that child is asking you, and you have to answer it for that child. That's your role. We've all been through the system where we actually have sort of, we had our own slates when we went to school, those of us who remember, and ours we could actually erase what was on it as well. The only problem was it couldn't be kept. Okay? What we're, I'm asking you what's the difference between this classroom. We were actually, we were actually prepared for a different type of society. What's the difference between that classroom and this classroom? Furniture is all there, it's nice and new, it's spanking, and everything else. We have our whiteboards, we have everything else. What may have changed is perhaps the technology, but I'm asking what has happened to the learning. I think why we're finding it so difficult to actually sort of comprehend and actually come to grips with is again, going back to Donnie, things are happening so fast. We're in a society now where things are happening so fast we can't even keep up with it. And if we try and stand back, and that's what we have to do now, is we need to stand back, take a pause, really begin to sort of interact and say, how are we finding this so difficult? If you take just maybe, for, think for a second that we're looking at generations. Generations are about, you know, 20 years or so, okay? So, if you look across human development, we've only got 10,000 generations, we actually had speech. It's a long time before anything else happened that really changed society, so we're looking at agriculture. Writing, 
you only think about it, it's got really sort of democratized. Only began in about 500 generations. Libraries, but libraries were really for the select few, and universities were really for the really select. Okay? Remember, for the writing, these were manuscripts. Think of the Book of Kells. It wasn't really until here that really the printing press, that things really began to shape up and take on a different light. And then if you look at down through it, some of us have lived through some of these generations, okay? You're looking at it's only in the last two generations. Some of us have been interacting with sort of computers. Some of us were using them in schools, as I keep saying to my students in college. We were using computers in schools, they're not new. We were using them in the 80s. And we're looking at some Jesus, you know? So you're looking at the internet and email. And then these are all only coming on stream. So it's no wonder we're having problems trying to work out how these fit in, what do we do with them, how has it changed our lives. Even people are having issues about coping. Like I look at Facebook, I look at the students I interact with and I'm saying, what are you doing Put all your life, every single personal issue up, stay forever. I'm asking people about senses of boundaries, privacy boundaries, uh, understanding sort of uh, what, 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 where you should do things, where you shouldn't do things. I can say to my son, I didn't do that, or whatever, there's no evidence. I did, there's no evidence trail. <laughs> but the thing is, they, the thing is up there forever, there's an evidence trail. So you have to say to yourself then, and who has control over that evidence? Why can't I have an issue and say to the likes of Facebook and everybody else, take it down and take it down now? Okay, who owns, who owns that data? Okay, so we need to actually fight and sort it out. So we've lots and lots of issues and we're only tipping the iceberg. And then the show does all things that are on the horizon. So if we don't, if we haven't sorted out the problems of these issues, we're going to have to really hurry up and try and work out what's going to happen in the future and who's going to be in control. Where is the locus of control? Who controls what? So when you talk about the humanology and everything else, who's actually in control? If we look at these sort of issues, What's happening? This is old data, okay? This is old data. And I think this has moved on. I mean, this is 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was very evident that the routine cognitive, the routine manual, these are the skills that were dipping off the scale, okay? I'm asking you, are these the skills that are redeveloping in our students, okay? What's really demanded now in the world of the future is critical thinking and complex communication. Look at this. And I'm asking, are the problems in school that we're actually engaging with and what we're asking our students to engage with, are they actually developing critical thinking and complex communication? Because that's what's, that's what's demanded of the world out there. And how can we do it? How can we actually harness the technology so that they, these things can be developed? And these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're thinking about a digital strategy for schools. So, we've, worked, we've moved into a world, we've moved from the industrial age to the age of automation. That was in 2000. And I'm asking you, now we're in, that's the biggest thing, we're in the access age. Everything is one to one. Everything is Wi-Fi. Everybody is connected. Access is not a problem, okay? What are we going to do about it? I think it demands holistic transformation. Not this tinkering, tinkering around at the edges, and we change this little bit and we change that little bit. I think we need to stand right back, look at the system and say, okay, what do we do? And that's your job. That's your job for a digital strategy for schools. How can we transform what's there? How do we redesign learning spaces? Or is what we have good enough? Because if you don't redesign it, that's what will happen. That's what will stay in place. <coughs> Even as I put up this slide, it's old because the technology is changing all the time. We're being bombarded. This is what the kids and everybody's interacting with. Only some of the stuff. So are we using this in school? How are we tackling it? How are we interacting with it? As Donnie said, do we know what are the top three or four things the kids value? 
These are the devices, some of them, that our students are interacting with. I got a phone call, they can know this, they laugh about it, I got a phone call from my nephew a short while ago from Cork, asking me to intervene on his behalf, he was gone. And my sister had, had said that he was now banned from all screens for a week. So he was having apoplexy, literally apoplexy. And he thought the only person that might sort of intervene on his behalf is the anti, she loves the technology, so I got a phone call. Think about when, well I knew when I was growing up, okay, think of how many, if, I was, if my folks had said to me, you're banned from screens, how many screens was I banned from? One. Okay, think of those younger people in the room, okay, and they said you're banned from screens. Okay, now try and think of how many screens you could be banned from. And this is an average nine-year-old, okay, so you think straight away, you think of, TV be way down on his folks, okay? So you're thinking of his iPod Touch, thinking of his, the phones from beyond to anybody, Nintendo DS, his um, Xbox, laptop, computer, DVD, okay? He counted them up, there were nine screens he was banned from. He thought his life had end, okay? So we actually may, 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 were able to do something and you say, okay, we have screens, but there was no Wi-Fi. That was it, because there was a particular offence had been committed. I think nine-year-old boys, right? So um, that actually went on, and then what he then was volunteering, if Luna was going out, that he would actually go shopping. George doesn't go shopping. Do you know what I mean? What he had worked out, of course, is everybody knows. And the thing that privacy settings had been set as well, so he didn't have access, okay? Why do you think he was going shopping? The man of God. Exactly. Wi-Fi, right? So he had sussed it. So that's what I'm saying. Look, these are the kids of the world. They have all these devices. They know they're connected. They're always on. Do we allow them to bring it inside the school? Okay? And then we have the cloud. Okay? And I deliberately, and some people have seen this before, I've picked this cloud because I hate these nice fluffy clouds. Because these nice fluffy clouds give the impression that everything is wonderful. Everything is not wonderful. There are sort of dangers hiding in the cloud as well. You know, there's those sort of things that are the privacy issues. There's the things of the connectivity. There's all sorts of things going on. Who owns the data? If I have my stuff and it's up on a Google server, where's that server located? What privacy issues are there? Who has rights over the data? Okay, there are all the issues that have to be sorted. So it's not a nice fluffy cloud. We do have to interact with it, but we have to be aware of the storms and issues and, that are there. Okay. I think everybody knows we're at a tipping point. And we have to say, okay, what do we do? This kid, 2014, is starting school. What are we going to make sure that she's ready in 2030? The world's going to be a very different place. Is she going to be ready? Are you going to make sure she's ready? Because it's your responsibility. You have a moral imperative. So I think what we have to do now is we're looking at the systems need to change. But the big question is how? How do these systems change? It's a necessity. Leadership is required, and I think we have hugely significant leadership in this room to do that. Changing teaching practices is the key. All the studies have shown the greatest impact <coughs> on a student's development and the world at large is the quality of the teacher. Student-centered learning is the goal because they should be in charge of their own learning. These are the knowledge society skills I'm sure everybody has come across in all their reading. And a lot of people agree that these are the skills that are necessary for living and working. And these are just some of the key skills. They've been nominated in the junior cycle now, reformed, they've been nominated in the senior cycle. Every curriculum you look at around the world, people are talking about these type of skills. How are we doing in the classrooms and designing learning environments that are enabling the development of these skills in our students? Are we using the insights that you, all you are doing in your classrooms to actually enable transformative teaching practices. How can we harness that? 
that we can actually enable that not just one child or the children in your classroom, but every child can actually have transformed learning environments. Well, I've deliberately just taken one piece of research because it's reflective of an awful lot of research that's out there, and that's what, what part of the digital strategy for schools. What they've done this time is, rather than get somebody like Michael before in or other people, you write up a strategy and it's delivered and it's said that's your strategy. This time around, what people are trying to do is they're saying, okay, there's a research piece, so there was a nice, there was a census design and a questionnaire went out. It was the first time in the census, there's been a good few census before, but it was the first time that actually teachers, teaching styles and attitudes and everything else were actually taken into account. Okay? Before, there was a lot of beam counting went on. How much technology have you got? It was focused on the sort of the device. Uh, it was focused on the connectivity. This time we're trying to work out where were teachers. So the census is out. There's going to be a, an extensive literature review done, looking at international trends, trying to connect that with the census. There's been the consultative process was launched. I was asked to write a position paper, which actually just asked a lot of questions. That if you don't know where the position paper is, it's actually on, if you just look up consultative process, uh, the position paper is there. Um, and I'd love people who read it and respond. And then they actually launched the consultative process. There has been a great response to the consultative process from around the country, different bodies. And I think now, what we were talking with Adrian today, I think what would be very useful would be today, taking these questions that were seven people, we're going to have a conversation, and that conversation is going to go right through the day. In everybody's path, there's uh, stickies, and in every room you go into, there will be cheats. My lovely assistant. And what's going to happen is, any thought that strikes you about how this strategy could be designed, put it on a sticky, stick it on the board. It will be collated. Adrian has kindly said, put into a drafted into a report and sent to the department. You have a voice, use it. Because you as a body are a hugely significant, powerful force. Here I talked about you know, setting up a, a committee as well, and they will feed, you will feed into that as well. But you, there's two, over 270 people here. Use your voice and get it out there because once it's on paper it can't, and in there, in the strategy, it can't be ignored. Okay? It has to be acted upon. If it's not there, people can walk away. This research comes from, and it's, it is reflective of what's going on all, all, over, all over the world. It's a piece of ITL research, and it was looking at students' use of ICT. Now, these, these schools have been selected by governments and agencies and everything else as being innovative schools. And what was very worrying was that students, even if they were using technology, and I find in of research, teachers may be using technology, but how often is it in the hands of students? I know that it is in your classrooms, but you're not typical. Okay? So that these sort of environments, look what was happening. Even when students were using the technology, it was very basic uses of the technology. There was very little high level sort of uses of the technology going on. And that frightens me. Then another piece that, to go with that, so sort of the sort of flip end, was okay, looking at teachers, looking at professional development. What type of professional development actually has impact? And this what you're doing now is not going to be terribly impactful. Okay? But it's what happens afterwards for the rest of the day is going to be important. Okay? As we set the scene. This thing about practicing a new teaching method, in other words, changing your practice and actually reflecting on it and actually being part of the community that actually shares that practice, that has the biggest impact. You are a community, you are changing your practice, how do you share it? This a lot of people are familiar with, and it's what the consultative paper was based around. And I think we have to. I was. I think. I think in pictures. So I needed a picture or a matrix to hang my thoughts on. And I think this captures the complexity of what we're trying to do. If you look at a strategy, okay. 
before, as people said, that, that focused on the device, so the connectivity, technology, it's technocentric. How do we actually make sure that we're actually moving from this UNESCO framework, sort of a tech literacy to knowledge deepening to knowledge creation, and this is where we should be, the knowledge creation, because unless, as Dahi had said, unless we learn to learn, unlearn and relearn, how are we actually going to live in a society that's constantly changing? But how do we get there? This is the technology piece. It is one piece. One piece of a complex framework. How do we make sure that the policy is in place? The curriculum, assessment, the pedagogy, in other words, how you interact and, and your, you as a teacher design learning environments. The organization within schools. I mean, we were having a conversation last night, we sat and Adrian, and we were talking about sort of, you know, the 40 minute time period, second level. Why do we have to keep it? That's not conducive to designing learning environments that enable deep learning. Why do we have to keep it? I'm, a, I'm asking you to ask big questions here. Step outside the box. Stop tinkering. Reimagine. As that's why Dougie's talk was spark the imagination. <coughs> spark the imagination so that you can look at this now and say, how do we get from here to here? And if you notice here, it's teacher professional learning. And it's professional learning rather than or what we talk about sort of, you know, professional development. Because we have to be the model learners. We have to be deeply rooted as learners, and we have to be seen as part of the learning environment. We don't have the answers to everything. How could we? The world is changing all the time. But what we need to do is be able to design learning environments that are learner-centered, and that means us too as learners. So, I'm going to ask you to think that, think that you can spend a whole day, a whole week trying to look at that and kind of sort of take it apart, okay? I'm just going to talk about one example. Those of you who know me know we were involved in the SIP project going back to 1998. There was a wonderful thing the NCT did. Probably the best thing that came out of IT. Okay? And the fact that schools and people like you, it was thrown over to you and saying, design learning environments come up with ideas. And we were able to uh, be in a position where I was able to work with teachers, fabulous people, and there's some people in the room here but that were in the Imperial Minds community. What is great to know is that that community is still going, okay, more than 15 years later, and we still have our robo show every year at community college. It's just an example of starting with the learner, starting with their ideas, starting with the story that they were actually looking at, they were reading Don Quixote, and one kid said, what, what, why, what, what was it about windmills? Why was he charging you know, at the windmill? And they began to talk about it, and he said, well, how is it, do we have windmills now? And that's what, how it started. And then the whole thing became, where were windmills, where were they developed, can we make one, what does it look like, etc. And I just have a short video, that actually, and what I want you to do is think of those 21st, as they keep referring to them as, you know, 21st century skills. But they weren't always just 21st century skills. It was always problem solving, complex thinking, critical communication. But we now, everybody needs them. It used to be for an elite few, the professionals. Now everybody needs them. Everybody. So how do we do that? Think of those skills. Look at this short video and say to yourself, how are these kids using those skills? And will they be ready? <coughs> First of all, we needed to find out how wind turbines are built and how they work. A good place to start was our local library. Where is the wind strongest? At the top of the hill or this is a small next to it? Three teacher a child kicked to the top. top. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, the wind is strongest at the top of the hill. Old. When the wind meets the hill, it is pushed upwards and gains speed it as it is compressed. And it's one group's work, okay? Here we are. The, the Skolnay Fiacra, intrepid scientists, down looking at the Richfield turbines run by electricity. We wanted to stop, so we just click OK. He was terrified. He's a postdoc. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's time to stop now. 
you should be able to see the, the RPM on the generator will come down, but our revolutions per minute were about 1,800, and there you can see that's dropping down, and everybody else outside is going to be able to see the blades will stop slowly. And Kids outside capturing what's happening. We read all about wind turbines in books. Now we wanted to see for ourselves how they really operate. We hoped we didn't have to go all the way to the top. And the wind said that there could be flickering effects on houses nearby but that happen here. So here we don't have it, but where we do have it we control the turbine and we tell it to stop when it's cause a flicker effect. So it doesn't cause it. Now see the way it was kind of a brownish red? That meant remote stop. Now it's green, that means the system's okay. Some of us found four colours of wire for our electromagnetic turbine. Magnets will pass over the colours to generate electricity. Meanwhile, the others were building upright sports for our rotating turbine. The turbine is beginning to take shape. Now we need to make sure the same pole of each magnet is facing towards the coils. We tested the polarity of the magnets using our multimeter. They realised they didn't have the skills um, and they were working, trying to find out who would know more about this sort of stuff. And then... We're going to turn it to 200 millivolts. On our wind turbine, there's a rotation sensor, and the rotation sensor me measures the RPM. The program runs for 15 seconds. The rotation sensor counts 16 per revolution. When the rotation sensor reaches 16, it adds 1 to the counter and then resets itself. Then it multiplies the counter figure by 4, and then we get the RPM value. You got all that, didn't you? <laughs> That was a presentation. We collect the weather meter daily to upload data. We dock the meter to the PC, open the Kestrel software and upload. We import the data into a template Excel file, save it under a new name and graph the data. We are interested in the wind speed frequency and the wind speed readings. And that was for a real task. I'll come back to what, what they're doing there. They wanted to investigate if it was possible to cut their electricity costs and it's uh, really install fast. a wind farm. Yeah, see if I, I can it. wind turbine. Yeah, it's slowing it's down. Slow. And then if I just take a bit They've of the shadow off, the solar two problems there. One is that um, we're not getting the sun, and the other is that the wires are on. So okay. do you want to try the um, wires again then? Switch them in. The solution is very simple. <laughs> These solar panels here are connected in series. They, t they turn this motor here, which turns the worm gear. The worm gear slows it down but also makes it more powerful and turns this gear here, which makes the wheels turn. This was the first time the car worked for us. We used our hands for brakes. <laughs> okay, so... I say they're not, they're not uh, near the kids, they're average kids, all the kids were involved, that was one group's work as they investigated, there were lots, there were three other groups did other work as well, that's just one of the videos. That's the type of world that I would like all our kids to be investigating. Real world problems connected to, you know, there was sort of narrative began the investigation, it went into can we cut our uh, electricity bills in the school? Uh, would it be possible to install a wind generator? They began those investigations, they built them, they understood how they worked. And they nobbled, which is in there because they didn't have the video, they nobbled the, um, the RTE weather guide to actually work out, because they knew the math, they knew those mathematical formulas behind it. And they actually worked with him. It was very impressive as well, a small, small 10 year old kid could up on a chair to actually explain this big, big mathematical formula to the parents because they presented to their parents to explain why it wasn't possible to have the wind turbine, but that they were now turning their energies to investigate solar possibilities. 
So they were in control of their own learning. <coughs> you didn't see the teacher there. He facilitated and designed the learning environment in such a way that the kids pursued their own learning goals. So I want you to think about that. Think about the other framework. Well, I'm going to ask you now, how are you going to input into the digital strategy? But remember, there's lots of other initiatives going on as well. How does it fit with the other initiatives within the system? Think back to that sort of matrix about the pedagogy, the curriculum, the assessment, and everything else. All these things have to be thought about. What are these? Why don't we join the dots? What implications then does this have for me as a teacher, this digital strategy? What implications will it have for my students? How are you going to make sure you have impact? So, very quickly, looking at your own professional development experiences to date, and ask yourself, what has worked for you? And how, could, how might we structure CPD in the new digital strategy for schools? Because I think teachers are key. You are the cement, the glue, the chain link. But how can we make sure that everybody engages in such a way that we have a professional learning community? How is that possible? How can you feed that back into the discussion? So if you talk, if you maybe take... The environment isn't great because we thought initially it was going to be all discussion at the tables, but it is possible. You could actually talk to pairs, triads, and then you can actually turn around and you can actually have groups of four. If we actually have it for about three to four minutes, uh, and if you actually can, what would be great is if you could actually record key points on the students, okay? And then we can feed them back out to Adrian's charts to begin with. That's the first exercise. And most, some of you know Padlet, it's like a, an electronic sticky board, so you can throw stuff up there during the day too, as well as do this one. Okay, so. Okay, thank you. So uh, we're just conscious of time. You, we're, we're just now standing between your uh, in your coffee. I suppose just looking around the room and seeing the level of engagement. Well, we did that for a reason because we think that what we need is we need much more. We need to rethink the model of teacher professional development. What you engaged in for the last four minutes was professional conversations about practice. What's worked for you, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see more of. So that's, the, that's what that was about. I just want to make a reaction to what Deirdre showed in the video there. Um, and I want to go back to Dahi's point about the Kigara. Where were the lesson notes for that activity? How would you assess that if you're a Kigara in a classroom? Now, I contrasted with a real situation in my own house in the last few days where a 10-year-old did a project on Kildare. Three facts led. Three facts spent 15 minutes on Wikipedia to find his photographs, wrote the sentence, typed the sentences. Sorry, he wrote them first. Then, Dad, you'll type it. And then I was on the road to Limerick the other morning with Marianne from high school, and I got a phone call in the car how do you print it out? So, there's a world of a difference between the two. Well, just to wrap, just on the, on the left, this is about developing teacher knowledge. All of you are here today because you want to develop your teacher knowledge. Many of your colleagues in your schools, 
they feel that their knowledge is nowhere near yours. How many times when you ask a colleague, how are you using technology? Oh God, I'm used to the old technology. I go to my doctor and he's about a little younger than myself. He got a new system a couple of years ago to type in his notes on uh, his patients. He didn't say to me, do you know Mick, I'm useless at the technology. We deprofessionalize ourselves all the time. We're in the learning business. We're not technologists. But on the right hand side of this slide, there is far too much um, focus on the technology. You can't really see that slide, but it's all the little, the gizmos, right? You go into your class on Monday morning. You are going to be teaching in a context. Could be up in Blanchardstown, out in Lucan, where I used to teach, or out in Newcastle, where Deirdre used to teach. There's a curriculum there. There's the pedagogies. How are you going to design that learning environment? And it's where the three come together is what's important. This notion of teachers to learners. You are all learners. That's why you've given up a Friday night and a Saturday to be here. Last night we went in at the tail end of the teach meet. Teachers as learners. Sharing professional practice with each other. Talking about it. There was no long lectures, but people were sharing and being generous with their time. On the left here is a, a graphic that I found for students. But imagine if we had one of those for teachers. Constantly evolving, sorry, inclusive, utilizes emerging technologies. There's a lot of people in this room that are in that space. Recently a teacher asked me about a particular tablet. They said, you know now, you know the technology. What tablet should I buy? I couldn't, you know. Someone said to me recently, tablets were something you bought in a, in a pharmacy. I couldn't tell you that answer. But if you wanted to know maybe how you might use it, uh, to teach something, I might be able to help you there. We're in the teaching and learning business. On the right hand side is the networked teacher. And again, and you can see all of the different ways that you are networked. Many of you write blogs. Many of you contribute to wikis. Many of you are uh, using video conferencing tools. Social uh, media. This slide is even out of, this graphic is even out of date. The number of you that are on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, I use it for professional development purposes. I spend most of my time just watching what other people are putting up and every so often I'll go in and click on it and I'll make it a favorite or whatever and retweet. And I was talking to another uh, principal recently, um, or former principal who's now an education officer, and she told me that it's her best way to get her professional development. So the days of the NCT, going back to when we started this in 1990s, 98. When we created courses, the one foot size fits all, and a box of the office, the staff of the NCT were surrounded by boxes, and course material was shipped from Dublin down to Godway, and you were an NCT tutor, and you delivered it. Needs to go. How could we cash in on the knowledge that's in this room and share? I think we need a different model, and it's a passion to work, a quilt model. Going back to the olden days, before we had Schools IT 2000, education centres would organise courses locally. And I see Joe Malai up there, and there was groups of teachers would meet in an education centre or a school and bring their computers and they would have professional practice conversations. Maybe we should go back to that. And we don't have to leave our houses now. We can do it from our homes. We can do it on Twitter. There's lots of tools out there. But we'd have a mix of things. Days like today are great. They energize the soul. But we need other things. We need courses in the colleges. We need lots of different types. So therefore, I'm suggesting to you that we have a patchwork quilt of offerings. And ultimately, it's about professional learning. That's what SESI is all about. 41 years in the go, must be doing something right. When Elizabeth and others started all this off, they must have been getting something. To me, it's going, hearing from other teachers, seeing what they're doing, listening to what didn't work, 
and what do you do? And I always get a great kick out of the story of the teacher who goes in and they hear the keynote and somebody puts up a great idea and they say, do you know, I could do better. And I say, fair play to you, go and do it better. But that's what it's about. Finished my little piece um, with the old Irish saying, we narc and curl the cable. It's about being together. And I think that's where we see the excitement with the new digital strategy for schools, is that we, there is an opportunity that ICT is no longer going to be seen as something that is the preserve of the ICT coordinator <coughs> or the ICT expert teacher. We're all in the teaching and learning business. So every teacher needs to know how to do it. And some people are less confident than others and we need to bring them along. And I was saying to a teacher recently, it's the conversation in the staff room and then to come down to my room to show me how to do that. That is hugely important, and many of you are the people in your schools that can actually do that. Your colleagues, they're not shying away from this for out of madness. It's because they don't feel confident. And no teacher, if they aren't confident, isn't going to start playing around with technology. I need to finish. So, so I'm going to finish this matter is innovation scale. It's small enough. And we have the energy and the passion, and I think this is what's really important, is passion. And everybody here is passionate. If we can actually get that and actually ignite the fire, spark the imagination and ignite the fire with the passion, I think we can actually crack the innovation. If we can crack it at scale because we're small enough to do it, and we've got the people. I think we need to be able to get out of the small little thing we're in, leap into the next bigger, better space. And I think that's what the National Digital Strategy for Schools can do. I said I'd come back to the fact that those kids were in uniform, out of uniform, in uniform, out of uniform, because they were managing their own learning. They wanted to actually demo and display a financial uh, young scientist. The reason was that they wanted to log with this guy from uh, different places and to share their talent and their knowledge and find out things. They realized they weren't going to get the project done in time. They actually came back. They did a sort of like sort of a needs analysis, looked at what needs to be done, prioritized, realized they weren't going to get things done within the time in school, and uh, organized between themselves. Uh, I live as a rural school, very rural. So it was a case of when I live in a certain place, I'm a dance on Monday, we used to be and we this, we that. They organized between themselves, lifts back and forth, they organized it, we the connection, bring back to the connection, we do that. When they were free, they went back to Tommy, the teacher, and said, um, would you be able to open school for us and give a list on this day, this day, this day, this time, this time, this time, this time. Uh, don't worry, everything is sorted. We talk to the parents and all, just need to open school for us. Because they were actually, that's how they're in the ordinary, they're, uh, they're cities as they call it, because that's when they came in. It. So who can get kids to the point where they're actually invested in their own learning to such a time that they can design their own learning goals? I think we're, we're there. And I think you can crack it. You're what the country needs to crack this digital strategy to schools. So please take the time out because my hope is of taking you. sales pitch, but um, Deirdre and I wrote a book, if you want to read more about our thoughts on this, uh, last year, it's called Reimagining Education, or Redesigning Education, and I brought, I had a few of them left in the office, so I just brought them, they're down the front, so take them away if you want to, because um, uh, I'm not bringing them back, okay, thank you. That we acknowledge the contribution that both Deirdre and Michael have made to us this morning, I think it is really vital for SESI as an organisation to, at the end of this day, to be able to have material to collate because it will go into the DES. And we have been invited to imagine what that future will be, but what are the steps necessary written in a strategy that will enable you go to your principal and say, look, this is where we are going. To go to your colleagues and say, this is the shape of a future which is supported through the strategy. It is absolutely vital that we have feedback. 
What I'm going to do is, would the people who are going to chair the first sessions please come up to the top and collect paper from me. Make sure you use the, those post-its, electronically or otherwise. If today is too much for you, there's too much going on, but over the coming week you have thoughts that you'd like to be incorporated, please, please get them to us through the list. We'd be delighted to take it. We'll leave it open until next week, the end of next week.